EME committee. And um, yeah, I just would like to say that the committee has been working very hard uh, and has been very diligent in bringing to you a multi-specialty and multidisciplinary set of lectures that some most are uh, pertinent to COVID-19 or the situation that we find ourselves um, as we're dealing with this global pandemic. We have some, we have a very exciting lecture today on the psychological aspects of a pandemic. And uh, I've looked through the slides and, and it just uh, appears to be a, a, a phenomenal talk with a very distinguished uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I also would like to announce that we have some um, very interesting talks coming up in the coming weeks. Next Monday, same time, same place, we're going to be hearing from a hematologist and on the hypercoagulable or clotting issues that we have been seeing with COVID-19. Uh, the week following that, we are going to be hearing from uh, a pair of lectures on genetics and COVID-19 and a virologist, a microbiology virologist, on some of the uh, nuances and the things that we've learned about this uh, specific um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Following that, we have a lecture on uh, what everybody needs to know in terms of oncology and cancer as it pertains to COVID-19. We also have a series of lectures that we are organizing and collaborating with the Bar Association on various uh, practice management, uh, business and legal issues as it pertains to healthcare. And um, I would, um, you know, I would uh, really uh, encourage everybody to uh, participate in all these. These are things that can um, uh, impact and help uh, from learning from this. It will help all of us. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Tonight's speaker is Dr. Pilavian. Dr. Pilavian is a gra graduate of the University of Oslo, Norway. He graduated in 1992 with a PhD in clinical psychology. He completed his fellowship at the University Hospital in Oslo, Department of Neurology and Psychosomatic Disorders in 1993. He completed his specialty in clinical neuropsychology in 1997. He then completed two research projects, allocation of um, attentional resources in patients with Parkinson's disease and organic amnesia following herpes simplex encephalitis. Um, in 2005, he earned a second doctorate degree from California Graduate Institute. Dr. Palavian is currently employed by the County of Los Angeles in the position of a clinical psychologist with main responsibilities in conducting neuropsychological for duty evaluations for safety sensitive positions of county employees. He has also a part-time private practice in Glendale providing second opinion evaluations to applications, the applicants of Cal, uh, California police agencies. Additionally, he provides neuropsychological evaluations of attention deficit disorders, memory dysfunctions, dementias, neurologic progressive disorders, and traumatic brain injuries. And a little while ago, we were talking actually, and Dr. Pillai telling us that yes, uh, telemedicine and telepsychiatry has become uh, a very, uh, you know, as it's become popular as of late, he said he was already doing that you know, in Norway back in the 90s, which is very interesting to hear. With that, I'd like to invite Dr. Pilavian to take over this platform. Dr. Pilavian, please engage your video and your microphone and uh, feel free to share the screen and, and go ahead and take over and give us this very interesting lecture. Okay. Thank you very much for the warm welcoming and uh, uh, I'm very honored to be with you uh, for this talk tonight. Before we start, I would like to take a moment to convey the following. 
The Armenian American Me Mental Health Association, AMHA, salutes you and thank you and thank the Armenian American Medical Society and Armenian American Nurses Association, the pharmacists, and all healthcare workers, members of law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders everywhere in the United States and Armenia for your leadership, selfless services, and dedication in treating and saving the lives of the victims of COVID-19. For that, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. So let's discuss, uh, address the objectives for tonight. At first, we will uh, be discussing the, if the evolution of remotely detecting cues of pathogens, the role of psychological factors in limiting and spreading contagion, adhering or resisting public health guidelines, the role of personality traits and cognitive style in the manner people respond to pandemics, treatment and interventions of psychological reactions during pandemics. So this is twofold, the last point. A part of it, it will be addressing the general public and the next part will be for healthcare workers, specific for physicians, uh, nurses, and all healthcare workers. So the declaration of interest, uh, let's discuss that real quick. I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. So this, let's start with talking about the arrival of pandemics. Communicable diseases existed since the agrarian era. Agrarian is when people where we, we started doing agriculture some, some 10,000 years ago, demarking the, the creation of communities and social networks, which formed a fertile soil for epidemics and pandemics. Communicable diseases that first appeared in the agrarian era included malaria, tuberculosis, leprosy, influenza, and smallpox. Hence, communicable diseases are thought to only thrive through social networks. So there is another aspect to this. Uh, research has shown that infectious agents such as bacteria and viruses are too small to be directly observed by the naked eye. Think of it. For this reason, a person's biological immune system is insufficient for preventing exposure to pathogens. Therefore, it is necessary to use sensory and perceptual cues to detect the presence of harmful agents. Such cues include nauseous smells and visual cues like the presence of people coughing and sneezing. From an evolutionary point of view, humans and other organisms have developed a remote detection system of pathogens utilizing the sensory modalities, such as olfactory, smell, visual, the eyes, tactile, the skin, and the auditory system, our hearing. Remote detection of infectious pathogens triggers disease-relevant emotional responses such as fear and disgust that motivate disease avoidance. Think of it for a moment that this uh, disgust as an emotional reaction works as a prevention or as a prophylaxis to prevent us avoiding uh, being in touch with the pathogens or infectious agents. Thus, Similar to the human immune system, we have the counterpart of it, which is called the behavioral immune system, BIS, is thought to have evolved as a first line of defense against infections. There are two markers of BIS, perceived vulnerability to disease and 
discussed sensitivity. So in order for us to defend ourselves against disease, we have to perceive that we are vulnerable and susceptible to infections. And the, so this is the perceptual aspect. Whereas the emotional aspect of this is disgust sensitivity or disgust reaction. Disgust re reaction or sensitivity refers to the degree of emotional distress and revulsion a person experiences when confronted with disgust evoking stimuli such as mucus, saliva, fecal matter, unhygienic people, some sexual behaviors, unsanitary environments, certain foods, especially if soiled or unfamiliar, particular animals, and the scene of dead bodies. They're all strong cues that evoke disgust sensitivity in us and fear. In addition, disgust by proxy is a reaction to specific objects that have been in contact with the above discussed evoking cues, like bloody surgical instruments or bloody cloth. Psychological factors play a vital role in limiting or alternatively accelerating the spread of contagion. Although some people may cope well under stress, Many others experience high levels of distress or worsening of pre-existing psychological disorders. How do people react to pandemics? Beliefs and fears about disease, just like diseases themselves, spread through social networks. More specifically, the source of information that triggers a reaction regarding pandemics, it comes to us through information transmission through news outlets, direct person, personal experiences, exposure to direct trauma, observational learning, observing other people's fright reactions. People's reactions to pandemics can range from fatalism to indifference. At one end of the spectrum, some people disregard completely or deny the risks and fail to engage in recommended health behaviors, such as vaccination, hygiene practices, and social distancing. At the other hand, end of the spectrum, people may react with intense anxiety. So we believe that a moderate level of fear and anxiety can motivate people to cope with health threats, whereas severe distress can be debilitating. So moderate anxiety is okay because it can be a good guide and it can be preventive. People attribute their intense anxiety to either becoming debilitatingly ill or being shunned and criticized for being ill or being or having been uh, infected or contracted disease. That happened in China. It was reported in Wuhan. Research has identified specific personality traits. So now we are focusing attention on personality makeup or attributes. Personality traits that seem to determine the manner in which we react during pandemics. One of these traits is negative emotionality, or we also use it interchangeably, uh, neuroticism, which is a general tendency to become easily distressed by aversive stimuli. Negative emotionality includes anxiety, irritability, depression, excessive worries about one's health, and a tendency to misinterpret bodily sensations or somatoform disorders. So they have a tendency of somatizing their worries. Whatever makes me tense, it can be converted into either diarrhea or headache or muscle tension. Two overlapping traits that are part of negative emotionality, trait anxiety and harm avoidance. So trait anxiety is 
uh, is different from state anxiety. Threat anxiety is part of the, in, the individual's emotional repertoire. Uh, the person is excessively worried about anything he or she encounters in life. They feel that the world is a dangerous place. Um, harm avoidance is another aspect. So let's talk about trait anxiety. So I'm sorry. So trait anxiety is, uh, is contrasted with state anxiety. So state anxiety is, is a type of anxiety that you have when you go to take an exam uh, or you go for uh, surgery or what have you. Whereas trait anxiety is there with you and it's part of your emotional repertoire. People with trait anxiety, over, they overestimate threats. Individuals who score high on this measure tend to believe that she or he is more prone to experience bad things than others. They also suffer from something else that is called intolerance of uncertainty, which is another facet of trait anxiety. People who score very high on this measure have a great need for predictability and tend to endorse the following sentence. We should always look ahead to avoid surprises. When faced with uncertainty, they feel paralyzed and indecisive. Harm anxiety refers to a tendency to avoid a potential risk and to worry excessively. To a certain degree, if this was in moderation, it's very adaptive function. But unfortunately, most people have, it, they suffer from excessive worries. Trait anxiety and harm avoidance are highly correlated with anxiety disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, somatoform disorders, mood disorders, and health anxiety. Now we will direct our attention to the role of cognitive styles. So these are types of uh, cognitive, a way of thinking, a, a pattern of thinking that is distinct from other ways. People differ in the way they seek or avoid information about potential health threats. Some people tend to have a monitoring cognitive style. They tend to scan, have, uh, they, they observe like a hawk their environment, while others tend to have blunting cognitive style. People who possess a monitoring style tend to seek information and scan for signs of health hazards. These individuals score high on disgust sensitivity. Blunters tend to distract themselves and minimize threatening health information. Moreover, blunters tend to ignore important precautionary directives. Monitors tend to be vulnerable to negative health information, whereas, and as a result, they tend to experience higher level of stress. The distinction between monitors and blunters has implication for risk communication. Monitors are more motivated to seek and comply with public health uh, information. In contrast, blunters are likely to avoid such messages. Simple and short messages are more effective for blunters. Monitors and blunters also appear to differ in how they respond to risk messages that involve logical or the blunters. They prefer court and logical messages versus emotional appeals, which is a property of the monitors. Blunters Unfortunately, they also tend to have a bias called unrealistic optimism, which is associated with persistent and unrealistic positive beliefs about one's future. Blunters tend to underestimate dangers, such as diseases and other hardships, even though they 
accept the potential of danger, but do not accept that danger and misfortune can happen to them. In the event of a pandemic, an unrealistic optimism bias can, be deliter can have deleterious effects. Individuals with this predisposition may become super spreaders of contagion and for good reasons. If I don't believe that things can happen to me, then uh, I will just be not careful. I will take risks. So this is the case of typhoid Mary in, in the 1930s when, when there was a typhoid outbreak in uh, the Midwest, she was an a, a asymptomatic carrier who infected 50 people before she was involuntarily quarantined in a hospital for communicable diseases in New York City. Upon her release, she infected another 25 people. Eventually, she was confined to a, uh, to a hospital in an effort to curtail the spread of typhoid. So this lady was a cook and she was oftentimes hired and commissioned by upper class families. So she went from home to another and infected um, people in that home. So this is an example of a super spreader who has unrealistic optimism bias and she can be defined as a blunter. Maladaptive coping. Monitors with high levels of, and this is, please pay attention, this is very interesting for physicians to know. Monitors with high levels of health and anxiety seek symptom relief, engaging in excessive hand washing, seeking excessive reassurance from medical doctors, which may add a burden on healthcare professionals. So these are the people who often visit the emergency room, call their physician, leave messages, they need excessive reassurance. Moreover, excessive need for reassurance increases the risk of obtaining conflicting opinions, receiving iatrogenic treatment, and reinforcing the belief that one's health is at risk. Certainly, the health anxious individual engages in elaborate and excessive cyberchondria, which is, which means you go on the internet and seek something that supports your hypothesis about your disease, which increases the odds that the person will be exposed to alarming, false information, and consequently will resort to doctor shopping, which places an undue burden again on the medical system and increases the chances that the patient will receive conflicting medical advice. Does this sound familiar? So let's summarize. Monitors have high levels of um, vulnerability to disease. They have perception of vulnerability to disease and discuss sensitivity. Negative emotionality, they score very high on it. They overestimate threats. They have intolerance of certainty and they seek excessive reassurance from MDs. On the other hand, they are compliant with public health messages. Blunters, on the other hand, they are low on PVD, which is perceived vulnerability and susceptibility to disease and disgust sensitivity. They are low on negative emotionality. So they are, they are not worried. They are just tough risk takers. With their unrealistic optimism bias, they are super spreaders and they ignore public health messages or they don't take them seriously. Psychological reactions during pandemics. Contemporary methods for managing pandemics rely heavily on behavioral or educational interventions. That is to say, vaccination, adherence programs, hygienic practices and social distancing in which psychological factors play a vital role. Public 
messages are usually delivered with elements that evoke anxiety and hope. So let's take an example of anxiety. First sentence, smoking is harmful and can cause cancer and can be fatal. Giving you hope, but if you stop today, your health will improve and you will likely prevent the development of cancer or other respiratory disease. This has been a policy and a method of delivering public health messages. Let's now focus on uh, the actions and diseases as in the aftermath of disease uh, or viral uh, contagion. There were reports that the outbreak of SARS triggered psychosis. The symptoms were associated with steroid treatment, which was used to manage cytokine release syndrome that can arise, arise from severe infections. As we will be seeing a little bit later, that this is not completely uh, in uh, congruence with most recent research. There is another class of psychological reactions that are the direct physiological consequences of infection. People infected by viral or bacterial agents, they experience a syndrome called sickness behavior, which includes symptoms of nausea, fatigue, sleep disturbance, depression, irritability, and mild cognitive. Research suggested that pandemic re related Stressors may even compromise the immune system, thereby making people more vulnerable to infections. Now we will address neuropsychiatric sequelae following pandemics. Reports from the 18th and 19th centuries suggest that influenza pandemics have been marked by increased incidence of various neuropsychiatric symptoms such as insomnia, anxiety, depression, delirium, and psychosis in particular. During the more recent 2009 influenza H1N1 pandemic and other coronavirus infections such as SARS pandemic in 2003 and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus MERS outbreak in 2012, several neuropsychiatric sequelae were reported, including narcolepsy, seizures, encephalitis, encephalopathy, yen barre syndrome, and other neuromuscular and demyelinating processes. Based on findings from past viral pandemics, it has been postulated that possible delayed post-viral sequelae of COVID-19 are expected to emerge. So COVID-19 uh, is not any different from previous uh, other influenza pandemics or flu pandemics. So we are expecting to see more neurological and organic uh, outcome. Keep things, now let's redirect our attention, this is meant for the general public. So part of the advices that can be provided to the general public is keep things in perspective. It should be pointed out that for centuries, people have survived hardship. Most people are resilient and adaptive. Remember that things will get better. Stay healthy, a healthy lifestyle, including proper Diet, exercise, sleep, and rest is a good defense against diseases. Avoid alcohol and drugs. One thing has remained constant through multiple pandemics is practicing hand wash. As Dr. Wilkes on second opinion on NPR, he always says the same thing. Soap is king, remember that. Wash your hands with soap. And when you sneeze, cover your cough and sneeze. Get vaccinated when a vaccine is available. Take time to relax, maintain your normal routine as far as you can. 
Maintaining social networks is a valuable way of sharing feelings and re relieving stress. Talk to a friend, to your spouse, to your brother, your sister, what have you. Stay connected via social media. You can organize some, uh, you can eat lunch together, breakfast or dinner, uh, of course, just by watching each other. Uh, so maintain social distancing. In order to minimize the effects of monotony and ultimate depression, divide your 24 hour cycle into three. So there was a reason. This comes from the unemployment literature, uh, which have shown, has shown that people who have uh, who stop going to work, their 24 hour cycle becomes monotonous because they wake up, they still in pajamas, they don't go out and they don't have to take a shower or shave or drive away. So this is an advice, which is very important for you to wake up every day at the same time, go to bed at the same time. Change, change your clothes, don't stay in pajamas when you wake up, shave, take a shower, open the curtains, let sunlight come in. This will help your circadian rhythm you will synchronize your wakefulness and sleepiness. Eat breakfast, start to think what to cook. And if you have children at home, help them to do their homework. In the afternoon, engage with your children, address their worries. If, there are, if you have concerns, those are adult concerns, I would recommend you not to uh, discuss those concerns with your spouse in the presence of children. Remember, whatever the children are listening to, they will take it differently, they will misinterpret it. So it's better that whatever is adult uh, concern will be discussed in between two adults. Don't take your concerns to the bedroom. From a um, sleep hygiene perspective, if you have concerns and you are ruminating, it is very advisable because your concerns are boundless, they are fluid, they tend to go from one concern to another and you will be engaging in excessive rumination and that will prevent, prevent you from falling asleep. So the best advice is don't think about your concerns and worries before bedtime. Give yourself two, three hours like at seven o'clock, start, start thinking about them, write them down. Once you write something down, it becomes specific as opposed to fluid and apply to each problem a solution, no matter how ridiculous or trivial that solution is, it will be helpful. When to seek help, some degree of fear or anxiety as it was mentioned about the flu is normal but sometimes people need help to cope with stress. Look for the following. And so to help you uh, assess the situation, look for the following uh, warning signs. Persist if you have persistent anxiety, worry, insomnia, irritability, or depression, avoiding social contact, the point that you have become isolated, Persistently checking um, your body for vital signs or persistently seeking reassurance from doctors, friends, and family. Engaging in excessive or unnecessary hygiene precautions, such as wearing masks even at home or while driving, and abusing alcohol or drugs or overeating as a way of coping with stress. Where to seek help? If any of the warning signs apply to you, then you may benefit from speaking or seeking the services of a licensed mental health professional. Where to find them? You can call your insurance and go online, find a healthcare provider directory online or by simply calling your insurance company. Now let's talk about helping the helpers. 
During the current and future epidemics, healthcare workers are likely to experience various kinds of job-related stressors, including the heightened risk of personal infection, sickness, and death due to frequent exposure to contagious patients, overwork and fatigue, exposure to death and dying, witnessing death on a mass scale, including death of children, inability to save the lives of some patients despite your great efforts, receiving threats from people who don't have access to healthcare uh, services, separation from family, loved ones, and lack of social support during a pandemic, the breakdown of protocol at the hospital, the fear of inadvertently spreading infection to others, including friends and loved ones. I will quote, to exemplify my points, I will quote Dr. Bay of Mount Sinai in New York State or New York City who stated, I honestly have no idea how I feel. I go to work and at the end of the day, I go to sleep. I have no time to digest any of this. So this is not good. Um, we all experience difficult things, stressful things throughout our day, but we need to process what we have experienced. So this is very important point. Lessons learned from the past. So now we will turn attention to treatment. But first, let's talk about screening. The screen and treat method is an approach to helping healthcare providers during a pandemic. Psychological services are announced to healthcare professionals in advance, offering availability 24 hours a day. This approach was utilized in 2005 during the London uh, terrorist bombings mainly detect signs of PTSD. During the London bombing, healthcare professionals who screened positive for PTSD or anxiety disorders were invited to complete a more detailed assessment with, with a clinician. So they developed brief screening instruments which have been uh, for use in primary health clinics. A brief psychometrically sound screening for PTSD is the four item primary care PTSD screener, which was developed for these purposes. So I will address this and I will talk about it in detail. Uh, in your life, so the first statement of this screening uh, sounds as follows. In your life, have you ever, so there is emphasis on ever, had any experiences that were so frightening, horrible, or upsetting that in the past month, you have had nightmares about it or thought about it when you did not want to? So there is an intrusive thought about this question. You tried hard not to think about it or went out of your way avoid situations that reminded you of it. We're constantly on guard, watchful, or easily startled. You felt numb or detached from others, from others and activities or your surroundings. So as you may see, there are two of them about avoidance or uh, avoidance and two others about emotions and intrusions. So the two questions in the beginning are about intrusive thoughts, intrusive uh, that you are trying to avoid situations. The third is about uh, is about emotional uh, uh, qualities such as being on guard, watchful, or startled. And the last is about being numb or detached. If you have answered three uh, yes to three items or more. It is considered positive and your screening results are consistent with symptoms of PTSD. For healthcare workers who experience severe level of pandemic related distress, more intensive interventions would be required. Disorders meriting clinical attention 
include major depressive disorders and PTSD triggered by the loss of loved ones or other traumatic events. PTSD, it should not be underestimated. It is known to persist well after the infectious epidemic has passed. People with persistent pandemic-related PTSD would likely benefit from empirically supported treatments such as trauma-focused CBT, cognitive behavioral disorder. Thus, in addition to the interventions discussed earlier, it would be helpful to train healthcare workers on a systemic level. For instance, educate healthcare workers on psychological aspects of a pandemic and management of pandemic-related stress. Organizational preparedness is another uh, intervention. Increasing emotional resilience by promoting adaptive coping. Self-care by taking regular breaks. Establishing a peer support group, identifying those who are at high risk, offering long-term support after the event to prevent residual effects. For frontline workers, it is very important to establish team cohesion and morale so as to combat fear, helplessness, and prevent burnout. And burnout is a very uh, important concept to keep in mind in these unprecedented times. Healthcare workers also would likely need support. They or their family being threatened or ostracized because people fear exposure to diseases. So let's say if, you, if your neighbor knows you are a healthcare worker, they will be a little bit hostile or they will avoid you. And that in itself can cause stress. These are situations that have been experienced in Wuhan, in New York City, and in maybe in, uh, in, in Seoul, in South Korea. The American Psychological Association just published an article titled Self-Care Advice for Healthcare Providers During COVID-19. Some of the advice are as follows. Be aware that uncertainty associated with health outcomes of your patients, dealing with endless emergent situations and the expectations that comes with being a physician or a healthcare professional are sources of great stress. So this first one, uncertainty associated with if, you are, if your patient is not making any progress, is in respirator and this situation is declining, deteriorating from one day or to another. This is a great source of distress and we should be aware of it. It is important to realize that you are working in an unusually stressful and rapid paced work environment. The human body and mind usually don't forget anything. If you have experienced higher level of stress, that will not be forgotten. The harm may not be immediate, but will inevitably be manifested later. Therefore, these are the times to engage in harm control. This is a very important concept to take. It's a takeaway. So what can be done? For healthcare providers, you will need to be your own doctor or diagnostician and your own patient in a non-simultaneous manner, of course, but successively. Monitor yourself for anxiety, irritability, agitation, anger, sleep deprivation, fatigue, social isolation, indifference, apathy, or feeling detached. Seek consultation from a peer, supervisor, or a trusted friend. Remember things will get better. Finally, I came to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank County of Los Angeles for giving me an opportunity to study psychological aspects of pandemics. My gratitude for the opportunity 
and for listening. Before I end this, I want to bring to your attention my ideas. Please note that viruses, and especially viruses, are very, very smart beings, very smart organisms. However, human mind and human uh, intelligence is time and time again have proven that we can win. At the end of the day, as for many centuries we have been coming out of it victoriously, paid prices, but we have learned about the pattern and we have used our wisdom. For this, I think humanity will win at the end. Be hopeful, be optimistic, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Pilavian. That was tr truly a very, very timely and informative uh, lecture. I'd like to invite Dr. Rami Apelian. Dr. Apelian is a My stream seems to have cut out. I'm not sure. Am I here? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Vika installed out, so I'm not sure. I wasn't sure if we were still live. Uh, yes, I, I want to reiterate what uh, Vika said, Dr. Pallavian. Thank you very much for that timely uh, lecture. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting. We've had a number of questions that have come in on the, the chat that I, I hope you can address. Um, I think one that we can all relate to and also have some challenges, uh, particularly those of us who have teenagers, uh, you recommend using social media to stay connected. But are there any harms on relying on social media exclusively to meet the need for that connection? Are there alternatives? And how do we address the issue with screen time when now a number of our children's educations are actually being moved into the uh, electronic world? Uh, very good question. Thank you for that question. So uh, these are unprecedented times, as everybody knows. Um, so the engagement in, uh, like, for example, eating breakfast, it has, it's limited, it has start, it has an end, and it's pretty social. Eating breakfast with, let's say, with your parents. Um, and children in that regard, they are not addicted to that kind of uh, screen time. Their addiction is more of playing video games, usually. Well, my, my take on this, this is a very unusual time. So engaging the children in family-wide activity is, is very a much, much better thing to engage in than uh, when they break out to their own rooms and play video games. Uh, one of the things is uh, many people have tried uh, to engage the children to talk about uh, their everyday life, um, or to, to discuss a topic from school, like geography, history, or something they have read that they like, and engage in a, a, an intelligent discussion. Um, if the children are very young, you can engage them in table games. I mean, even teenagers would love to play chess game, or they would love to engage in Monopoly or what have you. So engagement, uh, it's more social, it's much better, it limits also screen time. I don't know if I answered your question. I think you did, but you also made a very clear distinction in your answer between isolationist screen time and social screen time. And I think that's one of the challenges. I mean, I, I'm a parent of a nine-year-old child as well. So I, I understand, uh, you know, I mean, for years we've heard the American Academy of Pediatrics, for instance, tell us, no, we have to limit the amount of screen time. And then you, now under these circumstances, you go, well, 
the classroom is part of that screen time. And I think I do understand what you're trying to communicate that there is a difference between an isolated screen time where a child is only playing video games by themselves versus screen time where they're talking to their grandparents or their parents or other members of the family. So um, thank you for that response. Now, that said, you also said that rumination uh, with thoughts could interfere with sleep hygiene and uh, the ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. Uh, how, how do you interpret those uh, pervasive thoughts and how they relate to interpersonal intimacy in a marriage? Okay, so that takes us to something different. Interpersonal, it's a relational issue, which uh, it behooves the, the couple, the spouses to discuss it. Uh, and it could be a very fundamental thing, or it could be a simple thing, this synchrony, like when somebody is aroused, the other is not, somebody is sleep deprived, the other is uh, active, or what have you. So it's a relational problem. It's, it's not, well, it can turn, let's say one, one of the spouses wants that, the other is not wanting that. So the person who's rejected can ruminate on that. And I cannot completely understand that can interfere with uh, the person's sleep. That happens. Do not wait until uh, the end of the day. It, it is very important to bring this, uh, bring this up and in, in an adult and wise discussion between spouses uh, to, to discuss what could be the under, underlying reason. Um, maybe something can be fixed, can be easy fix, or it could be uh, something that is difficult to fix. The one person is unaware about the reason. It could be a pain issue. It could be emotional issue and so forth. Thank you very much. You also mentioned the difference between PVD and DS early on in your conversation. Uh, and perhaps in answering this question, it would be worthwhile to redefine PVD and DS. But, um, you know, we are all facing challenging times, whether we are healthcare professionals or we are not essential workers. Uh, would it be safe to say that some of the reason we are seeing potentially some social unrest or protesters coming out is because that ratio between PVD and DS is different among people who have potentially lost their jobs or not working versus those of us that are in the front lines? Yes. I believe it's multifactorial, the under, underlying reasons. So it could be financially motivated. It could be motivated by political uh, conviction, or it could be it's their uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive style. So if they don't perceive and they have this romantic, uh, uh, exaggerated, excessive, uh, optimistic bias, and they think that this nothing of uh, coronavirus will happen to me. So these people will be motivated to come out and to demand to go to normal life. So it could be uh, multifactorial. So Dr. Pallavi, I don't mean to interrupt you, but while you were answering the question, I've had a couple of messages come in asking us again to define PVD and DS and what that means in terms of how sure. people are feeling. Thank you. Okay. So PVD is perceived vulnerability to disease. Many people believe that they are more sensitive than others. So they are very fine-tuned uh, and their radar goes up uh, to capture uh, risk factors in the environment. So some, you can think of some radars are fairly hypersensitive while others are very dull. So enemy aircrafts, when they come, uh, some, some radars will not capture that while others 
will show you false negative. So if this is very, very active, the, the perceived vulnerability, people will, have, will become uh, psychosomatic, meaning they will somaticize every worry they have and they will become hypochondriacs. Um, so it's a perception. It's a hyper intunement. The person is very in tune to capture risk factors of the nature of diseases, virus, viruses, bacteria, and fungus. Whereas the, the disgust sensitivity is an emotional reaction to the perceived vulnerability. So one is on the perceptive side, the other is on the emotional side. It's a reaction. Was that satisfactory answer? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, to, to develop on that thought, uh, are you aware of any data that has emerged over the last eight weeks, 10 weeks since uh, we in the United States have gone into uh, some social isolation measures uh, regarding the suicide rates and how they compare currently with the rates this time last year? Unfortunately, I, I must say no. I, I have no statistics on that, but I know if, um, what, what I'm saying now is common sense uh, kind of um, answer. These people who are committing suicide, well, I'm not minimizing it, but I must assume and postulate that they must have had pre-existing psychological issues, uh, but, so and, I actually, and I'm now going to expand on your response to the previous question. Okay. Um, so you discussed an individual and individuals who express negative emotionality and how negative emotionality almost creates an avoidant environment. So if you have a patient who exhibits negative emotionality on the surface, but then continuously engages in potentially self-harming behavior, how do, you, how do you engage that individual? How do you address that individual? Well, self-harm, um, so again, uh, I'm more inclined to think if somebody is self-mutilating, self-harming, uh, those are individuals that have a pre-existing condition because a person with perceived disease uh, vulnerability, uh, they are hyper-tuned to, to be very healthy. They seek health, and, but unfortunately, they are, very, they are very difficult to convince that there is nothing wrong with them. Uh, so that's the problem with uh, people with uh, high levels of uh, negative emotionality, PVD, and disgust sensitivity. But back to the idea of self-harm. I can think of situations when the person has extreme levels of despair. So in this situation, we need to think of situational events, such as the loss of loved ones, the job, that the person held, maybe lost their, his or her house, or, or loss of hope, hope and, and the person is feeling helpless. And the totality of that situation is extreme despair. So the person will think, I, I'm better off dead. And some people will act on it, unfortunately. But people out there, have to know there is uh, despair and hopelessness and helplessness are transitional states of mind. There is always light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Dr. Pallavi. And I think, you know, in light of what you are saying, you know, there's often a social justification that an act of suicide perhaps may have been a selfish act, but I think one of the things that you're suggesting is that this individual actually in their own mind may have thought that their, uh, their action um, is for the benefit of others. 
And um, this is one of the challenges I think we all face uh, when dealing with stressors. And it's important that we understand that there is a difference between um, uh, being able to reach for fa- for help and, and and closing off those doors. Uh, one, one more thing I want to add. Uh, most of the challenges and things that we experience in life are reversible. Most of them. Unless somebody is uh, confronted with a terminal disease uh, or the loss of someone, that loss of life cannot be brought back. Aside from that, most of the things in life are reversible. So it's a good thing to bear in mind. I, I agree. Um, we, we received an anonymous response um, today uh, during our talk as you and I were conversing. Uh, this is actually a, a, a JAMA report that was released today with a conclusion of what it calls, quote, optimistic considerations. And uh, the closing statements in this article say that there may be a silver lining to the current situation as uh, suicide rates have declined in the period of past national disasters, for example, the uh, September 11th attacks. And one hypothesis is that we uh, have a so-called pulling together effect whereby individuals undergoing a shared experience might support one another and thus strengthening social connectedness. It goes on further to say recent advancements in technology like video conferencing might facilitate pulling together and that epidemics and pandemics may also alter one's views on health and mortality, making life more precious, death more fearsome, and suicide less likely. Well, um, to add to this, I in the, uh, in the era post-World War II, Despite the atrocious, I mean, the difficult situations uh, that people during World War II have experienced, um, epidemiological uh, studies have shown during wartime, the level of, of depression decreases. Why? Because people are in a survival mode. They don't have time to be depressed. They don't have time to, um, you know, to, wallow in their misery. Um, so makes sense. So also the idea of when new unprecedented situations occur in life, there is the, the, the law of serendipity kicks in that we do something like that occurred by chance and we start seeing the positive in it. And we implement uh, our creativity to uh, overcome the uh, the things that are unusual. Thank you. And it's interesting because uh, I've been uh, discussing with one of our attendees, um, uh, Vahe uh, Shamoradi, and he says, Dr. Palavian, you talked about the monitor individual and the blunted individual and their difference in perceiving health issues. Socially, I think of this as the millennial and their parents. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if perhaps that's what you suggested, but from what I am seeing in my day-to-day activities, I certainly can relate uh, to how you define both individuals. So my question is, is how, how do you identify someone who is appropriately monitoring and someone who is pathologically suffering from an illness anxiety disorder? Well, so this takes us to the idea of adaptation, maladaptation. So a person who's maladaptive is doing it in excess. And uh, as I said, the radar is hypersensitive, is constantly, constantly uh, scanning the environment for pathogens, even though there is none. And that person is usually uh, have obsessive compulsive disorder, they have health anxiety, and they have also uh, anxiety disorder in general. So a person who's informed 
let's say they have learned a good deal about medical disorders, diseases. They take reasonable precaution, precautionary measures. Every time I touch something, I wash my hands. If something unfamiliar or sticky that my hand touched it, why take chances? I'll wash my hands and be on the safe side. If I smell something funny, I would know this is uh, a sign of contagion and so forth. So the difference is in the degree of uh, the engagement. So there is adaptive and mal maladaptive. If we don't overdo it, it, we're doing it for the benefit, benefit of our health and to prevent diseases. If we're overdoing it, then it becomes an obsession and it's maladaptive. Thank you. And for those people who are blunters, can you perhaps elaborate on a short, simple, effective message on trying to communicate to them uh, the seriousness of the situation? Yes. As um, public health authorities around the world have found out that it's better to speak to the blunters with short messages. And the messages should not be emotionally laden. They need to be short to the point, succinct and logical. For example, to uh, most likely to educate the blunters to say, not everybody is, uh, okay, if you are exposed to someone, not everybody will be symptomatic. Some of us will be asymptomatic and spreaders of the disease. If we can communicate this to the blunters, we have done a big favor to our community. So the blunters need to be educated, but not with long messages. And there shouldn't be um, an admonition type of message. It should be, you know, by the way, if you don't do it this way, you could be one of the spreaders. Thank you. Um, while you're answering the question, uh, Dr. Supilian and Hosmig and I are, are, you know, coordinating on the backside to try to uh, ensure that uh, we are addressing all the questions because some of the questions come in on Facebook and some of the questions come in on Zoom. That said, we do have a question from Facebook and it says, um, a rapid decline once symptoms present themselves doesn't close the monitoring of vital, vitals, like a, using a pulse oximeter. Um, it doesn't make sense if over monitoring in other situations might be dysfunctional. So how do you differentiate between appropriate monitoring and potentially dysfunctional monitoring of blood pressure, temperature, or uh, pulse oximetry? Well, the, the simplest answer to that is, is the frequency, how often you monitor yourself. For example, if you are from before, do you have high blood pressure, HDN, uh, it's very appropriate that you monitor your blood pressure from time to time. If you don't have it, you constantly feel you have palpitations. You're, you are hyper-monitoring your own body and the more you monitor yourself, the more you will feel anxiety. So in, in, the, in, in the clinical world, when a patient comes and say, oh my God, my heart was beating 120. So the answer to that is, well, that is very normal. When you are afraid, your heart, your heart will beat fast. And they say, and then I felt dizzy and I felt I was about to faint. And I go, how do you find this paradox? When somebody is about to faint, their blood pressure drops. And you're saying your blood pressure was high and yet you were going to faint. How do you make sense of it? So addressing the, the, the discrepancy in what one say, it's helpful. Uh, and then sometimes we ask, how many times you felt that your heart was racing and nothing happened? 
no adverse or health crisis uh, came out of it. Uh, and the individual will say, oh, it happens every day. And so, so th these are cognitive behavioral approaches to this kind of problem. Uh, did I answer the question? I, I was... No, I think you did. I think you did. I, feel I, went I, on I actually, and, and, but no, no, but I think this actually affords an opportunity, uh, Dr. Palavian, for a number of our attendees to understand what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Very good question. So, traditionally, when we started our crusade in psychology, it was based on psychodynamic thinking or psychoanalysis. And that has like another type of thinking. It was based on the conscious, um, subconscious and uh, the unconscious. So there were certain operations that were going on in the person's mind. Well, suffice it to say, it was built on conflict model that we all have conflict between our conscious or our the, uh, the super ego with our sexuality. And the ego was squeezed in the middle between superego, the id, and the and society, and that's why we had we had constant tension and anxiety. That was the model of psychoanalysis. We said it with a couple of sentences. So, cognitive behavioral therapist uh, Dr. Aaron Beck was a psychiatrist. He believed that we don't have to go the route of the subconscious, uh, the id and the ego and so forth. He thought the way we think it makes us feel in a certain way. For example, I feel something is wrong with me. I feel my heart is racing. Therefore, I feel I'm anxious. So what I'm telling myself, it, it leads me to the way I feel. So this was like put upside down from the psychoanalytic thinking. So the cognitive behavioral therapy is, it's born in the thoughts. Uh, so the way I think is the way I feel. Very, very uh, briefly said. No, I, I think the question lended itself to a complicated issue, obviously. Um, but I think in summary, I think uh, you've done a great job in helping us understand uh, how cognitive behavioral therapy can potentially bridge the gap in some of the mood disorders that certainly can help. Yeah, so, so to give you an example, for instance, uh, a person who is very sensitive to rejection may go around and think, I should be very cautious because I'm not lovable. Nobody likes me. Historically, I have been rejected multiple times. What makes me think that I will not be rejected today? So let me stay behind. So this is a type of thinking, which is um, a cognitive error. So you, if you ask the person, how many times you went to school and said hello to your uh, classmate and they returned your hello? Well, many times. So you haven't been rejected 100%. So again, those are cognitive di distortions and you can challenge them. Back to you. We can't hear you. Thank you. So I have two different opportunities to mute the microphone and apparently I did not, I was not aware. Thank you. Okay. One of the questions that have come in from our audience is the idea of compassion fatigue. How, what are your thoughts on compassion fatigue? Well, we are all as uh, healthcare, mental healthcare professionals, we operate on the most fundamental uh, instrument, which we call empathy. It can also interchangeably be called compassion with our patients. Um, this happens very often 
in situations where there is a lot of suffering. This reminds me of the biblical situation when Jesus was walking uh, in, a, in a situation where there were people suffering from leprosy, I believe, and everybody was needing help from him. And at the end, he couldn't take it anymore. I'm not professing religion here, but just a biblical allegory. So uh, compassion um, fatigue is something we experience, especially when we work uh, with patients with PTSD. You lost someone who experienced something unbearable. For example, when I was in undergrad, my first patient was a mother who had lost her son in rafting accidents. So this was back in Norway. So during uh, springtime, all the rapids become very violent. And this unexperienced kid took the raft and it was rafting down the stream and he drowned. So I remember vividly, I became overwhelmed by that uh, fatigue, compassion fatigue with this mother who had lost a child. Um, another example, I know an Armenian psychologist who was working with a survivor of a genocide. She was very, very old, or he was very old. And he told the psychologist what he had experienced. The psychologist lost it. He, he became uh, very compassion fatigued because of that. So what is the, uh, the best remedy to it? Is sharing, is receiving consultation, or even therapy for it. Uh, sharing what you have experienced, it has a very uh, remedial or therapeutic effect uh, on a compassion fatigue. Now, imagine yourself as a frontline healthcare worker, and everyone you see is a frontline healthcare worker. How do you share experiences with each other without? potentially crossing that line with your colleague. So which line might that be? I'm sorry. Uh, the one that causes emotional collapse. Mm -hmm. Well, my answer to that, it's okay to cry with your colleague. It's okay to, to lend him a crying shoulder. It's okay to hold your colleague's hand and, and say, we're in into this together. Um, so empathy, maybe it's too much to give at all times in such hectic frontline environment. But nevertheless, if I know I can trust you, I can come to you to talk about how this patient died in my, hand, in my arms. He was young or, you know, the, the the peculiarity of the certain situation must be shared with someone else. And so too many people would think it's a very trivial thing to share something. Well, I disagree because when you share, you are processing an experience. You are putting it in context. You are telling a story and a story alongside a timeline, space, and what have you. So all these things are, they might sound like they are trivial, simplistic, but in reality, they are being processed by our cortex, by our hippocampus or what have you. So it's interesting because I think you actually touch on a very sensitive point that as healthcare professionals, I, particularly those that are not mental health professionals, rarely uh, discuss with each other, which is the vulnerability of human relationships. And I think one of the things that I hear from what you are saying is that potentially by even having these conversations, we may be healing ourselves. Absolutely. I couldn't agree uh, any 
I think I agree with you 100%. And I think one of the challenges is if you take an ER doctor or a surgeon who's not typically used to having these conversations uh, and encourage them to be uh, emotionally vulnerable, I think all of us can, can move forward with our own individual healing during this very difficult time. We are facing some very, very challenging times. Let me tell you a story about uh, my experience from Norway. Most psychiatrists in Norway are former surgeons. Do you know why? Because they've lost patients. They've lost patients and really got to them. They affected them. And they became psychiatrists. I don't know if this is the case here. They did it for two reasons. Either they had poor vision or they had lost significant many patients and and that couldn't it was unbearable for them so they delved into psychiatry as as a discipline but everybody needs this we need it everybody needs it and so uh, you can call it venting you can call it catharsis or what have you but we all need to process we all need to process these uh, unusual events that are may become overwhelming, unbearably overwhelming. Well, and and the challenge is is there's a lot of uncertainty both in our professional and our personal lives, and that certainly can be very unsettling uh, when we rely on the infrastructure to provide us the organization that we rely on on our day to day. Um, I just want to share with you a positive comment we have received. Thank you, Dr. Palavian. Uh, I also uh, want to say I'm so empathetic to the healthcare workers on the front lines. I'm so afraid they're going to have PTSD, but I want to add that one might self-monitor for poor coping behaviors such as drinking too much alcohol, not sleeping, or engaging in risky behavior. Was that a comment or a question? It was a comment. Okay. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, yes, of course I agree. Um, so everything that is maladaptive, for example, um, many of the safety sensitive positions in the county, uh, th these are people who have experienced something very difficult like shootout or extreme uh, situation that uh, a sheriff deputy Experience. So instead of dealing with it, um, like putting all the events uh, together on a timeline, processing it, they start drinking because that could be part of the macho uh, culture. Uh, so, and especially males have the propensity of keeping everything inside. Females are much better than us in sharing their uh, experiences. Uh, for that reason, I believe it's more adaptive. Uh, whatever happened, it happened as an experience and that experience has to be discussed and processed, not dealt with with chemicals. No, I think that's a very, very good point. And I'm actually gonna, Thank you for entertaining the questions and uh, want to thank our audience for allowing me to moderate these questions. Uh, Dr. Palavian, uh, we are honored to have you uh, pre present this information, answer these questions. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sapilian at this point, who is going to step in and uh, conclude our presentation today. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Rami, very much for um, moderating this session. And uh, just to um, reiterate the point, at some times you saw uh, Dr. Apelian looking down at the screen. You know, what, what he was doing is behind the, behind the scenes here, there are usually several uh, devices where communications are taking place. And when he was looking down, actually he was uh, fielding questions. Um, um, Dr. Palavian, I'd like to uh, conclude by sharing a story. Um, 
you know, we have been doing these sessions not only locally for our membership um, and our attendees, but rather we've been doing these sessions internationally um, where in 15 different countries where Uh, when Dr. Apelian is out, I would like to say the honor is mine. I really feel um, this was very meaningful. It's a fantastic audience. Thank you very much for the questions. I'm not sure uh, I answered them all fully, um, but I'm humbled by many of the questions. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be a part of this evening uh, presentation. I think with this, we will conclude uh, the presentation. We will conclude. Thank you all for attending. We will conclude. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pilarian. My pleasure. Thank you.